Okay, hello everyone. This is uh, Maurizio, editor of Power Electronics News and uh, UWeb. Uh, today we are with uh, uh, two great speakers, Robert Misbeck and Adam Kabuski, uh, at, uh, both at Mitsubishi Electric. Robert is uh, Chief Operating Officer and Adam is uh, Vice President with Mitsubishi Electric Power Products. <clears throat> hi, uh, Robert. Hi, Adam. How are you? Going well, Maurizio. Thanks for having us. Yes, good morning, Maurizio. So thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Robert and Adam, for, for having you here to, to talk about uh, uh, smart energy, smart energy for, for the future of the planet. <clears throat> this is a great topic, I guess. But before starting, uh, please uh, introduce yourself, Robert and Adam. Okay. Um, okay, my name is uh, Bob Misbach. Um, as Maurizio said, I'm Chief Operating Officer of Mitsubishi Electric Power Products. Uh, we're a wholly owned subsidiary of Mitsubishi Electric Corporation, and uh, we take care of infrastructure uh, industries for uh, Mitsubishi Electric. Uh, and our biggest infrastructure industry uh, that we work in is the electric uh, power industry. And I've, uh, I've been in the electric power business really my uh, whole career. I began in, uh, in power generation uh, business, traditional power generation, then moved into renewables and battery energy storage. And now uh, um, in Mitsubishi Electric, uh, we work with all those different technologies. Uh, predominantly, our biggest part of our business is, uh, is in uh, transmission and distribution. Excellent. Adam. Good morning. So Adam Kabalski, I'm the Vice President of Sales for Renewables. So I joined Mitsubishi Electric in 2017, primarily to launch sales into the solar industry, and then following that into energy storage. So grid scale energy storage solutions and power electronics are, are near and dear to me. I actually started my career as an engineer uh, designing low voltage drives. So variable frequency drives, which then were used to, uh, to, to build some of the early 1,000 and 1,500 volt solar inverters. So I spent a lot of time as an engineer uh, working with power electronics and now I'm selling them. Excellent. Okay, so um, I would like to talk with you uh, about smart energy, renewables energy, and uh, so how uh, we can see the future of, uh, of, uh, of the planet. So uh, zero emissions is uh, a target. Uh, of many countries that are willing to reach uh, by next year, by, by 2050. And uh, we can see a lot of uh, investment in terms of uh, grid uh, technology and energy storage, uh, et cetera. Uh, renewables, power grids, and uh, other energy trends emphasize the reliability of uh, uh, aging electrical uh, infrastructure and uh, transmission, but also distribution lines uh, around uh, our world. Uh, growing and supporting renewable uh, energy pose uh, a lot of challenges, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as you know. How do you see uh, the future of uh, uh, renewable energy adoption? I guess that we uh, we must increase even more solar, wind, these uh, uh, sources, renewable energies for uh, for reaching for the zero emission goal. What do you think, mm. Robert? Well, you can uh, you can start. Yeah, I think um, I think renewable energy has a tremendous amount of momentum in the United States right now. Uh, I think the last uh, quarter. Um, uh, we set another record for renewable power deployment. And I think a lot of states are reaching their renewable power goals even earlier than they had originally planned. So that shows that renewable power generation technologies are already becoming the most economic alternatives in many markets. And, and that really, uh, that, that economic um, advantage is driving their adoption more than state mandates in, in many cases. So that's kind of the first point is that there's already a lot of momentum. And I, and I think we're starting to see the beginning of sort of a self-reinforcing cycle of adoption of renewable power. Mm -hmm. Because every uh, since wind and solar power don't have any fuel cost, uh, in the markets where they're being adopted, you're seeing lower and lower prices for energy. 
right? And, and that is in turn uh, driving more demand. And it's also starting to drive electrification of more industries, which is gonna increase the demand for electricity, right? So then you're getting into this self-reinforcing cycle it's kind of the same thing that happened in the communications industry when smartphones came out, you know, and the price of data transmission started to go down further and further, which led more and more, uh, which led to more and more applications uh, for, for, for smartphones. So, so I think that's all positive, but as you say, it's, it's hard to know if our current uh, uh, set of market conditions is going to lead us to zero uh, emissions soon enough, mm -hmm. right? And I think transmission and distribution capacity uh, could likely become a limiting factor, right, in, uh, in renewables deployment. Uh, already, uh, our studies group uh, is seeing uh, uh, interconnection queues in most of the country are stacked up with interconnection requests from renewable power and energy storage projects. And so those studies are really uncovering the need for more transmission and distribution capacity. So I think this is going to this is going to play out over years, right? That uh, the 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 upgrading of the electric grid is going to be a multi-decade uh, uh, exercise. Um, so I uh, so I think uh, new technology is going to is going to be necessary to to yeah. speed this thing up. So those are Adam. That's key points that I, that I think. Thank you, Robert. So, Halam, what do you think? Yeah, so the U.S. Is, is unique in that we are driven by individual states, each with their own policy. So in the earliest days, this was policy driven. And even today, it still is to, to some degree. But I think currently we have maybe 17 states. Um, and I believe also District of Columbia and Puerto Rico have 100% clean energy commitments. And if we look at states that have some commitment down to 25%, that increases to maybe I think 37, 38. So we have just so many states in the US that have made this commitment. And even the ones that haven't, that's primarily the Southeastern US. So yes, they don't have clean energy commitments, but they have great solar resources and just pure economics are driving growth. I mean, look at what's going on in, in Florida, you know, millions of com commitment of million panels of solar. Um, Tennessee, TVA has committed gigawatts of renewables. So whether it's policy or the economics, um, we're, we're just really seeing strong commitments to 100% energy goals. And that in turn is gonna increase renewable energy adoption. And I, I think those percentages and those numbers are gonna further increase as the early leaders prove it out. So as they show the economics do work, as they show that the technology works and that the integration challenges aren't nearly as bad as people think, you're going to see just massive adoption across the entire US. Uh, I mean, talking about the aging transmission, like it's really gonna get highlighted though, because here in the US we have great wind resources in the middle part of the country, great solar resources in the Southern half, but that's not where our load pockets are. You know, our load pockets are on the coast and especially in the Northeast. So the people that are needing that energy are very far away. So we're testing that transmission infrastructure and we're showing that it really needs to be upgraded and improved. And I think this is an opportunity for us, you know, as a, as a provider of high voltage DC transmission, you know, this is where DC transmission will really shine. So bringing, you know, large generation resources all the way across the country and then even uh, offshore, you know, we're, we're starting to see the early days of offshore wind. Uh, we've got these good resources in the Northeast but you got to get it somewhere and there's no transmission infrastructure right now. Excellent. So uh, I mentioned at the start several uh, technology, energy storage, but also grid uh, technology, smart grid. Uh, so we have a lot <clears throat> around smart, smart grid. The grid uh, of the future is all about renewable penetration and uh, increases the electricity co consumption. So power grid technology of course, can improve uh, uh, energy efficiency. So uh, how is uh, uh, renewable uh, energy impacting the, the power grid? So I guess that uh, uh, we also should uh, think, uh, look in terms of, in terms from a perspective, a good control uh, definition, optimization, digital management of uh, <clears throat> distributed uh, 
uh, energy uh, resources. So should we talk about any standards also too? Robert. Uh, of course, uh, I think um, information technology is, 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 is key to, uh, to modernizing the grid. Right, you, you need technologies which are able to understand what the situation of the grid is and diagnose uh, where, to, where electricity needs to flow and how to, uh, how to control the flow of it. And so to do that effectively, right, you need, you need standard uh, communications protocols so that all the grid's devices can communicate with each other. So that's a big area, I think, of standardization. Mm -hmm. um, and I think increasingly you, you, want, you want the grid to be sort of a plug and play environment, right? Where you can buy a device, plug it into the grid, and it, it yeah. becomes part of the, of the network and is able to uh, communicate and act in concert with other, with other uh, parts of the network. The, the other place that I see standardization or... or um, or rules kind of helping is, uh, especially in the solar industry, you know, the amount of uh, capability that's in each inverter and the technical capabilities of, uh, of each generation, uh, whether it's wind or solar, each, each generation plant has to be modeled and understood, you know, to figure out what the effect of the, uh, the effect on the grid is. So those are two areas where I see, you know, I see increasing uh, mm -hmm. standardization and sta standard uh, creation of standards. Thanks, Adam. So the, the cybersecurity concerns are valid. It, it's <clears throat> something that's no more apparent than, than really right now in the US following the Colonial Pipeline incident. So mm -hmm. that's everyone's worst fear. Can you cripple the infrastructure through a cyber attack? And it's something to be rightfully concerned about, but I always like to stop and think first, do, do we live in a connected world or an unconnected world? And it's clear over the past decade, the world is more connected than ever. The benefits of data is clear. So let's accept that there are so many benefits to being connected digitally and build the standards, build the systems in the safest way possible. And here in the US, we have great standards through NERC, right? NERC has its critical infrastructure program well-defined cybersecurity requirements. We followed those on, on projects and, and it works well, but you have to embrace the risk that occurs. You have to embrace what could go wrong and build a very robust system, protect everything, put the right hardware and software, and, and even just programmatic and people concerns, like make sure that you're protecting everything from not just the intrusive attack, but the accidental fault through human error and build your system so that it's robust. But, you know, I just see too many benefits to being fully connected, taking advantage of the data and optimizing the system to say that, you know, we shouldn't be thinking cybersecurity, we should just be disconnected and, and live in a, you know, 100 year old grid like it used to be. So power grids involve uh, uh, several uh, technologies. What is the most, uh, the most critical? So which one can be a good boost for the success of grids, Robert? So uh, I think the key capabilities uh, for the future are uh, controlling the flow and quality of electricity and storing that electricity, okay? And so for, um, uh, at, and so to get those capabilities, uh, two technologies that, that we have put a priority on are uh, number one, uh, power electronics. So power electronics technology enables you to control the flow and, and quality of the electricity, uh, which has never really been possible. I mean, electricity uh, follows the path of least resistance. So we, you've never been able to control the flow of electricity really as well as you can now with power electronics. And power electronics enables you to transform DC current into AC current, uh, which is an enabling technology for most renewable power, including wind and solar power. Uh, and any kind of a battery uh, usually involves DC electricity, right? So then power yeah. electronics is basically an enabling technology for all three of those, uh, of those applications. 
Um, and then in transmission, as Adam mentioned, we're, uh, we're doing high voltage uh, direct current uh, transmission lines, right? Which is another key component in the modern grid to be able to transport large, large quantities of power. So power technology or power electronics, I think is, is a key thing. The other one, as I started to mention before is information technology, right? Because uh, in order to control all these devices in a way, in the most efficient way, right? You have to be able to uh, monitor the grid, realize the, the situations, forecast what's gonna happen in the coming minutes and seconds and then tell all these devices that, that are installed in the grid what to do in order to keep the grid efficient and stable, right? So those are the two technologies that, uh, that we think are gonna be important in the future, power electronics and uh, information technology. The, and information technology also will help you uh, reduce the operation and maintenance uh, expenses, right, for the, for the grid. So. Um, so those are those are the ones that uh, that we've put a priority on. Excellent. So Adam, for you, well, which one can be a good boost for the success of grids? Yes, I'll, I'll just build on the power electronics answer. I, I mean that flexibility is so important to the grid. Uh, and, and again, it's things like PV inverters, energy storage. And let's look at how well those systems performed during the winter storm, the February storm that kind of wreaked havoc on ERCOT. So all of the challenges related, or most of the challenges I should say, were related to rotating machinery. You know, either whether it was the fuels getting delivered to traditional generation or the rotating portions of wind turbines. But power electronics, you know, we've always designed them with hot and cold extremes in mind. They're static devices. There's no moving parts. They work well in these demanding climates. And that's not even taking the, the performance benefits into account. You know, power electronics inverters have sub-second response times, uh, highly fast ramp rates. Um, they can supply reactive power. They can inject harmonics to provide harmonic mitigation. They can do all of these things that just traditional generation was never able to do. So the grid is able to perform in a way that you know, the early inventors of the electric grid just didn't envision. So you know, more power electronics is gonna be a great thing. They're reliable, they're functional, they're flexible. I think that's gonna be just a core component of the power grid in the future. And then the, the other storage, and, and we'll get into to more detail on it, um, I suspect, but whether it's short duration, you know, on the order of hours or long duration, you know, 12, 12 hours, 24 hours, or even seasonal storage. This is gonna be the most critical technology that, that's possible uh, because that's what's gonna allow us to retire gas generation. That's gonna be able to retire uh, nuclear generation. It's gonna allow us to make renewables look more like firm capacity. So <clears throat> energy storage, battery energy storage is uh, another trend that can, uh, can support, uh, in this case, uh, the, the request of uh, high, high peaks of, uh, of a current, but also <clears throat> the advent of electric vehicles. Uh, so renewable energy for use uh, later and uh, energy storage uh, on the grid for various uh, goals, for various uh, targets. So what parameter should designers consider concerning energy storage? Um, what are the challenges? What is the future of uh, uh, energy storage? Bob, Robert. Mm. So uh, I think energy storage, um, we can see that energy storage, uh, when energy storage <coughs> first came out, everybody thought it was too expensive, okay? Yeah. And, but now I think it's clear that energy storage is starting to make electricity cheaper and cleaner. Okay, so the first place energy storage was economic in the United States was in, uh, in the PJM and some of the Northeastern markets for frequency regulation, right? Which is, which is stabilizing the grid uh, from short-term um, ups and downs in supply and demand, right? And to do that, uh, you need a battery with a duration of about 15 minutes. Right, so the first batteries that were economic in the, in the grid in the United States were 15 minute batteries. And then over the past couple of years, you've seen the demand for energy storage in Texas take off, 
right? And uh, most of those systems are one hour batteries. And also uh, recently we've seen some big systems put up in California uh, to cover the uh, peak shifting, you know, to, to cover the, uh, the late uh, afternoon, early evening peak when the sun is going down and the solar power is dropping off. And those batteries are uh, four hour batteries in most cases, right? So you're starting to see, you're starting to see energy storage um, be adopted for these short-term applications. You know, the, the cost of frequency regulation in PJM, I think is less than half of what it used to be before energy storage, right? So, so that cost gets folded into the price of electricity. So energy storage has really reduced the price of electricity in PJM, and it's starting to have the same effect in other markets. So I think it's already, you know, starting to show its value um, not only in price, but in, you know, all that short-term fluctuation used to be taken care of by ramping up and down fossil units, you know, which were, which, which had a lot of uh, emissions, right? So it's already making, you know, things cheaper and things cleaner. The challenge for energy storage is growing in, in application and duration, yep. right? In other words, we're starting to see people experiment with hydrogen, you know, for long-term energy storage, other, other types of technologies. And, and that's going to be, I think, the ongoing challenge in the coming years is to address more, uh, you know, find more applications that energy storage can, uh, can help in. Anna, what do you think? Yes, you, you touched on electric vehicles and it's very interesting to me how closely yeah. coupled grid storage and electric vehicles are. They are one another's biggest ally and threat. So the, the real explosion of energy storage globally has been due to the cost decline. And that cost decline is purely based on customer adoption of electric vehicles. We're seeing globally just massive amounts of consumers that are buying electric vehicles. And that explosion in the supply chain is what gave us in the grid industry access to low cost batteries. So on one extent, you know, we are following their cost out, we're following their technology, and it's a good fit right now. But we're starting to see, and really 2020 showed it to us, us competing for resources now. So China puts a mandate for electric vehicles, and all of a sudden, the grid industry can't find batteries anywhere. And that was an eye-opening moment, and that had people start to look at what else is there, what types of chemistries are not dependent on electric vehicle supply chain, can we go to compressed air again, or is hydrogen the future? So everyone had this real watershed moment of, we depended on electric vehicles, and all of a sudden they could take our entire supply chain away and leave us without any solution at all. But the other piece where they're tied together, and it's really interesting to me, is the EV itself is, is a distributed battery. We're soon going to have millions of batteries just driving around and, really positioning themselves where we need them most during the day. They're gonna be parked sitting idly at the load center, right? Where people are going to work. So we have these assets that aren't being used for their intended purposes, but can we use them? Can we start using these batteries at customer facilities for peak shaping? And then when they drive home in the evening, can it be backup for that person's home? Can that become a backup solution? So. This hasn't been solved well. There are some tests. Mitsubishi uh, Motors has been involved in some tests as well as Mitsubishi Electric in Europe. And we're learning this and just the pure benefits of having these assets, you know, moving where they're needed and, and dual use because the batteries are getting better and better. And they don't need to just be for a couple hundred thousand miles of discharge. They could be used for, you know, full depth daily cycling. And it's a really, really interesting challenge and opportunity. Hmm. Excellent. So we are uh, in conclusion. Just uh, the last one, just a look uh, into the future, uh, very fast, a few words. How do you see the future of energy, Robert? Uh, I see the future, uh, I'm an optimist. So I, I really see this unfolding well. I mean, I see, I see this whole thing uh, <clears throat> driving, driving uh, down the cost of electricity in the long run and driving up the uses of electricity, right, in the long run. So when I look out, you know, 20, 30 years, I see, 
you know, most industries have been electrified and we're all using uh, clean power and, and, the, and the grid is stable, right? The, um, you know, the supply is, uh, supply is, uh, is, is, is reliable and, uh, and the power quality is very good. So I, I, I do think there's a, lot, there's a lot of momentum going in the right direction. I think it is, uh, it's a question of how fast can we get there. Thanks, Adam. The future of energy, it's cleaner, it's cheaper, and it's more flexible than it's ever been. Excellent. Thank you, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for this uh, great interview. It's been a pleasure to talk with you about uh, smart fuel, smart energy, energy for uh, for the future. Thanks a lot, Adam. Thanks yeah. a lot, Bob. Bob. Thanks, Maurizio. Great to have you. Thanks. Stay tuned. Goodbye. Goodbye.